2010, David K. Jennings would pen the script to Stephen King's Pet Cemetery and would go on to write a screenplay for Stephen King's The Stand in 2013, which would also go nowhere, was tasked with adapting Stephen King's It. The problem was the studio needed it to be two-thirds the length of the miniseries. And only having 130 pages to work with, anyone could see that this adaption was doomed from the start. So what was this failed adaption like? And how much of King's story was bastardized for this two-hour film? Well, let's start with the big ones. The script updates the time period from the 1950s and 1980s to the 1980s and 2010s. However, this change does nothing to the overall story. The kids don't encounter it as Freddy Krueger or Jason Voorhees, nor does it update the dialogue, except for when a young bit and less to movies that have come out. But something that does change the story significantly is that Stanley Uris and Mike Hanlon were cut from this version, with Bill being the one to stay in Derry, becoming the town librarian. It's clear that this change was made so the other losers would have more time to be fleshed out. Except, it wasn't enough. As the remaining losers except maybe Bill and Richie just feel like Cliff Notes versions of their book counterparts. Giving Bill Mike's role could have made sense and added to Bill's character. I mean, it killed his brother. However, you never truly get the sense that George's death affected Bill in any major way. And the reason he stayed in Derry is... well... You know what? I'll get to that when we get to the end. And Stan will and will always be a useless character and just a body to add to Crown. The film structure would have been very similar to the book, with the younger losers being shown via flashbacks. However, by doing this, their friendship feels more rushed and it feels like a group of kids thrown together with a common enemy in Henry Bowers. Not it. After Bill runs over to the crime scene in which he finds an 8-year-old boy slaughtered wearing a hat made out of old newspaper, or more accurately, the paper boat Bill makes for Georgie. This is where we get our first of many flashbacks in which Bill witnesses the death of Georgie. In this draft, the confrontation between Georgie and It is rushed. Instead of It luring Georgie closer and closer, the scene only lasts half a page. We cut back to the present where Bill calls the other four losers. Richie, a closeted radio host who's having a relationship with a station manager, Ben and Beverly, whose characters' differences are so minor there's really no point in getting into, and Eddie. We then get a flashback in which Pennywise tries to lure Ben in by offering snow cone. And he probably would have taken him up on the offer had Henry Bowers and his gang not pulled him away and carved an H into his belly. Ben's able to escape and with the help of Eddie and Bill, they're able to avoid Bowers' gang. We are then treated to the Chinese restaurant scene, where after they all catch up, Bill begins to talk about the most recent murders, and it's past in Derry, going all the way back to 1902. And in this version, there are no tricks from Pennywise. They also don't go off by themselves. Richie and Eddie go to the Niebold house, which has now been torn down, to make room for an entertainment complex for the children of Derry. This is also where we get a flashback of the young losers building the clubhouse, which is now the remains of an old hunting blind. Here, Richie tells Bill, Ben, and Eddie the time in which Pennywise, as Robert Gray, tried to blow him under the Neville house, followed by Ben recounting the previous scene in which Pennywise tried to lure him with snow cones. Bill then realizes that this thing is what killed his brother. We then cut back to the present in which Ben and Beverly make their way to the Bassey Park, and Beverly recounts a time where Sink had its time of the month. We then cut to Pennywise using the form of Victor Chris to bust Henry out of the psychiatric center. This is where I started to notice something about the script, and that's unnecessary changes. Instead of Bob Gray, it's Bobby Gray. Instead of the Jade of the Orient, it's an Okinawa diner. Instead of Juniper Hill, it's Riverside Psychiatric Center. Or changing the time period from the 1950s to 1980s. It's changing for the sake of changing. We then cut back to Eddie and Richie, in which Eddie has another flashback, in which a pharmacy assistant tells Eddie that his medicine is They're gazebos! They're bullshit! And as this is happening, Richie goes outside and starts chasing balloons. He then finds himself at a bridge where he watches as dozens of children emerge from the darkness of the tunnel, followed by Pennywise, who chases Richie on stilts. This scene plays off as laughable. The only thing that this scene does is reveal that at one point Richie was suicidal. We then cut to when Henry breaks Eddie's arm, and this leads directly into the rock fight. However, it really doesn't work here. You see, in the book, Mike and Henry's relationship goes far beyond just bullying. In the book, Henry is an absolute monster. He begins throwing treats at Mike's dog over a few weeks before giving him a poisoned burger and watching as the dog slowly dies. Most of Henry's behavior can be attributed to his father, who is never seen once in this script. In the book, the six losers band together to help save Mike. After that, he becomes a seventh member, and the Losers Club is fully united. Lucky seven. But in this, the losers are already all together. And unlike the book where it feels more like the completion of a group, it feels more like a plot point that had to be scratched off. They cut back to the present, which Eddie and Richie realize that there's no stopping this to come. 
We then cut back to 1985 in which the losers go to Knee Vault to kill it. Here is when we get our first taste of what's to come. And no, it's not the turtle. But time travel. No! Yes! No. Yes! No. Yes! No. Yes, no. Yes, 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 no. Yes, 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 no. Yes, 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 no. Yes, 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 no. Pennywise then bursts through the pipe. Beverly misses her first shot. It's able to attack Ben and would kill him if Bill hadn't thrown a piece of porcelain at it. Richie then pulls down an old shower curtain and pulls it over its head. Bev's able to reload the hand cannon and shoot it in the face. It then jumps back down the pipes, retreating to its lane. They then would make their way back to the clubhouse where they decide they have to go to the sewers to kill it once and for all. We then cut back to the present when 85 pages in, Tom Rogan, who hasn't been seen since page 12, decides to come back. And it's too late for me to care. This script has Tom, Audra, and Henry, and frankly, it's too much. Ben and Bev make it to her old apartment, and we find out through Mrs. Kirsch that her father, Alvin Marsh, is dead. We then cut to what could have been the most horrific scene in the script, in which Alvin Marsh, under the influence of Pennywise, demands that Beverly remove her pants. Beverly understands what's going on. We as the audience know what's going on. However, this is as far as it ever goes. We then cut back to the present where Beverly realizes that Mrs. Kirsch is it and runs out, finding that the building has been abandoned and fallen apart. And then after that, it shines its deadlights at Tom through the TV, and 95 pages in, with only 35 pages left, Henry Bowers makes his return, buying a knife from a gas station. We then cut to inside the library where the losers are talking about their last fight. Bill, Bev, and Ben go outside to get air. Inside, Eddie reveals his real thoughts on his mother. He then gets a call from It disguising as his wife and goes to the bathroom, where he's attacked by Henry. Outside the bathroom, Richie's alone and watches as the blood starts pouring from the spines. The books. Bill, Ben, and Bev run back inside as Audra, who's been there the whole time, comes down standing wide-eyed with what's going on. In the bathroom, Eddie is bleeding from his head and arms. Eddie's able to escape and tells Bill that it's been recruiting, and demands that they have to do it now. Bill tells Audra to go to somewhere where there's lots of people. The losers then make their way back to the townhouse to patch Eddie up. Beverly runs to a room to grab a med kit, but is stopped and beaten by Tom. Then wraps his belt around her neck and begins to pull it tight. She's able to grab a lamp and begins to beat Tom over the head. Ben then makes it to the room and shoves Tom off her. We then cut back to 85 where, off screen, Henry went crazy, tried to kill his dad, and chased Ben, Eds, and Bev. We then cut back to the present where the older losers make their way back to the sewer. We then cut back to the past where the losers gear up and Vic, Belch, and Henry get closer. And this is where I realized that nothing in the script has made me root for the losers. Although Richie and Ben had encounters with it, only two have any real connection to it, and they're Bev and Bill. Eddie hadn't even encountered it until the Nebel house. Eddie is also given nothing to do besides tell his mom off in one scene. He doesn't even die in this script. That's right, none of the losers die in this draft. It never felt threatening unlike the miniseries. Even though it wasn't scary, you still felt as though that this thing was dangerous. In this, just like the rock fight, it just felt like something that had to be scratched off a checklist. Which is not good when he's the title character. After the older losers make their way through the sewer, we get a montage of the city of Derry being destroyed, and honestly, it's hard to care. Unlike the book where the town is an entire character, here it just feels like a small town that's hiding something. They then make their way to the echo chamber where the young losers are confronted by Vic and Belch, who ask losers for help. Henry's also there, but before he can do anything, it emerges from the darkness and kills the two young boys. Victor, by being yanked by the hair and whipped around, and then hurled against a wall. And Belch, who gets his neck chewed through and heart sucked out. His corpse is then thrown aside next to Victor's. Beverly aims, it then pins Eddie to the ground, and Beverly aims again and drills a rock right into its leg. Light then floods the room, and it grabs Henry and dives back into the crawling space. The older losers make it to the lair. Oh! Remember when I mentioned time travel earlier? The little door behind them bursts open and it comes shooting in, flooding the room with light, holding a young Henry in his grips. Henry screaming, slashing it with a razor, but then hit with the deadlights and a connection is made. Ben then shoots a number of times at it, but it seems to do nothing. Eddie then steps in with his aspirator and sprays it. This breaks the lock between it and Henry and it lashes out at Eddie. It then grabs Eddie, about to pull him into the same awful embrace. However, Beverly is able to pull him back down before anything can happen. Eddie then yells, let's finish it. This is when it's revealed that an 11-year-old Bill has been watching everything. Older Bill then says to go back and get the others. Bill then reveals that the reason he stayed in Derry was because he's the only one to remember time traveling. Yes, instead of a David Lynch-esque mental battle between reality, we get time travel. We get older and younger losers simultaneously beating up it. Bill then grabs it and then proceeds to 
instigate the ritual of Chud. The older and young losers begin beating it up as more of Pennywise's victims begin to pop up. Dozens of kids begin beating up Pennywise at once. Young Bill's then able to pull out its heart. It dies and everyone goes back to their timeline. Bill is then left in a catatonic state. They then escape the collapsing sewers with the help of some rescue workers and we fade to black. In this, the losers stay to take care of Bill. Audra visits him every day. Eddie stops talking to his wife and is able to fix up Silver. Bill recovers and slowly rides as we get a voiceover about childhood. We then cut back to the young losers carrying Henry's body out, who's also catatonic. And as this worst screenplay draws to a close, I can't help but be unsatisfied. I didn't care about the relationship between the losers. I didn't care about it. I didn't care. Nothing in this script made me care. You know how little I care? I'm not even gonna film an outro. See you later. But you know, there were those two unrelated screenplays written by Kerry Fukunaga that, you know what, maybe I'll save those for a later date.